I'm delighted to welcome uh, our three fantastic panelists. We have Rachel Kite, Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, uh, Jerome Powell, an advisor to the White House on climate issues and uh, founder of One Million of Us, and uh, uh, Brad Smith, uh, president of Microsoft. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Mm. Our topic is, as Ed mentioned, the issue of climate change. Uh, and we're at so kind of a pivotal moment here, about seven weeks ahead of the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow, which starts at the beginning of November. Uh, next week, climate change will be a big issue at the UN General Assembly. And on Monday, the Secretary General will be convening about 30 heads of state uh, in person uh, for a special session uh, devoted to climate change. But they also have a very tough task ahead of them and, and kind of an uphill uh, battle. A few weeks ago, we had a warning from the IPCC uh, about the state of the planet and the impact that global warming is having, not in the future, uh, but already uh, today. So my first question to the three of you is, uh, what would you like to see happen at the UN General Assembly at COP26? Uh, what is the sort of best case scenario? What would be a good outcome in your view? And Rachel, I'll go to you first. Well, hi, Leslie. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, when the Secretary General convenes um, just a small group of 30 leaders, what he's going to be doing is, is asking them to uh, put a lot of effort in over the next 40 odd days to try to cement the strongest package, political package possible uh, at COP26. And that really has three pillars to it. One is um, clarifying ambition uh, for, for certain key polluting countries. Um, sort of stopping the doing of stupid things, so ending subsidies and get some stronger commitments there to really come up with the strongest and most robust package that they can on adaptation. Um, obviously, countries are already experiencing extreme impacts on climate change. That's focused imagination over the last few months. And what is that adaptation package looking like? Can more be done? And then thirdly, finance. Now, the UK presidency... Um, has said that uh, COP26 is about coal, cars, cash and trees. Well, both on coal and cash, things could be done. All eyes will be on China, whether China will use the General Assembly as an opportunity to clarify uh, its exit from coal and in particular its financing of coal overseas. And then uh, all eyes are on the United States to come with more finance, while John Kerry is working furiously to stitch together the leveraging of private finance and to do uh, other things which are creative and innovative, the US uh, is behind in its commitments and finance. And if it were to make a bigger and bolder commitment to make up for the years that it lost, uh, that would go a long way in meeting the totemic 100 billion uh, climate finance uh, requirement that uh, is a hangover from previous negotiations. So some of these things could clear the pathway for COP26 if leaders were prepared to act politically, and that's what the Secretary General will ask of them. So more, more money and action on coal and a real need for the political will to, to come together and get that signal from those leaders that are there. Um, Jerome, I'd like to turn to you next. What would you like to see from uh, the General Assembly next week? I know you spent over a year, I think 58 weeks, uh, uh, protesting outside the White House for climate action. Um, it's been a lot of, of change since you first started those protests, um, but what would you like to see happen next week? Yes, yeah, so when we talk about what we wanna see at the UNGA next week and what action really needs to happen is that we need for America to step up and be the global leader that it says it wants to be. Also, we need for the dialogue to shift from a, a talk of carbon neutrality and a talk of, oh, well, we need to, fiddle around the margins when it comes to coal, whether it comes to the transportation of oil. Well, that goes to our double talk on reliance on fossil fuels while also trying to shift to clean energy. We need to have clear political fortitude that's seen at, COP, um, at, at UNGA and at COP26. And what that really show, what that really means is that from my climate strikes and from the young people that organized in 2019 and 2020, we need to have our demands met. 
whether that comes to the Climate Change Education Act, which will teach young Americans and young, young people around the world to be able to enter into sustainability jobs, or whether that comes to um, where we have to end subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. Right now, when we talk about the, when we talk about the, the economics of, of climate, it really isn't a free market. It is completely rigged because governments have sided with and continue to side with the fossil fuel industry by giving handouts and subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. We need to have a level playing field where renewables can fairly compete with fossil fuels because we know for a fact that solar, solar panels and wind turbines are cheaper per kilowatt hour to fossil fuels. So we need to see that type of action seen at, at the UNGA next week. So the U.S. has sort of started to talk the talk, but you'd like to see them walk the walk and really uh, put put actions to match their words. Um, and and Brad, what about you? What would you like to see next week uh, at the U.N. General Assembly? Well, I would like to get started, I think, by building on what you've heard already. Um, I think the one thing that we can fairly predict is both next week and at COP26, the great questions before the world will be, um, are we moving fast enough and what more do we need to do? And the answer is clear, we're not moving fast enough and there's a lot more that needs to get done. I would point to two additional areas that I think it's critical to add to the agenda. The first may not be the most dramatic or exciting, but I will argue it is the most fundamental to everything else. We need urgently to build the capacity for all of us around the world to measure carbon emissions in a consistent, effective, and efficient manner. We've all embraced the need to reduce emissions, but we should recognize that our ability to measure them is remarkably nascent and is inconsistent around the world. And it's like asking everybody on the planet to go on a diet, but suggesting that no one ever step on a scale to see how we're doing. That is the state of affairs today. And unless we address this effectively, we're, we really risk, I think, deceiving ourselves in terms of how we're doing in the coming years. And then the second thing I, I would say is, in addition to all of the steps needed to reduce emissions, we need to build a new market for carbon removal as well. We need to help foster an industry that frankly doesn't yet exist today. We need to invest in the technologies that can help us remove carbon. And so there are these elements that I think need to be added to the agenda. The first being the most urgent, but the second being equally important from a long-term perspective. So not just looking at the political commitments, but also the, the need to measure and verify emissions and look at carbon removal, which is pulling carbon dioxide from the air. Correct. Next, I'd like to ask the three of you about the role of the private sector. Uh, the UN General Assembly is, is really about governments and, and political will and leadership. But uh, in the past 12 or 18 months, we've also seen the private sector uh, really shift its tone in terms of what it's doing on uh, climate change and climate commitments, including from uh, companies like Microsoft. I'm, I'm looking at Brad there that are, have pledged to go carbon negative by 2030. Um, is the private sector doing enough? And what sort of signals will there be from the UN General Assembly that the private sector should perhaps take heed of? And Rachel, I'm going to come to you first uh, for that. Well, I think two two points. Um, so Brad makes some very, very important points about sort of the, the, the role that the private sector can play in sort of building the new architecture and the new way we govern ourselves in a world that has to rapidly decarbonize. Uh, and I think we are in that world. We're in a world now where we've got uh, governments and the private sector and civil society working together around the new rules for high integrity in carbon markets and what are going to be the ways to put satellites up in the air that measure methane and make those uh, make that data available to everybody everywhere in real time. So we're in that world. But the General Assembly is sacrosanct, especially for developing countries. It's the one place where it's one country, one vote. And I think we can't, while we, while we nurture forward this world, we have to understand that developing countries come to this General Assembly 
feeling extremely, I mean, to put it politely, frustrated and aggrieved. Uh, we have failed to bring forward a global vaccination program which protects everybody. We are facing a climate crisis which is having huge impacts on the GDP of these countries who did nothing to put themselves in this place. And we have no commensurate plan to help and we have no deal on climate finance. And so they'll be forgiven for thinking that we talk a lot about our excitement, but we don't do the basics in terms of lifting everybody up. And that's the politics of the General Assembly and that's the politics that the UN are having to manage. And as we come into COP26, every day that goes by, the closer we get to COP26, where really the, the pledge of solidarity from the developed world is not really on the table, it makes the kinds of political agreements that are necessary very difficult. So we're in, we're in a two-speed world. The private sector can see around the corner, can see what needs to be done. It needs to be nurtured. We need to make that transparent and available to everybody. And developing countries are saying, look, you've been making big promises around money and technology for a very long time, and we're not seeing it yet, and it's not flowing. So I think we're trying to straddle those two things. That's right. And that's why we have seen last week, as Ed alluded to, a call from over 1,500 uh, climate groups saying that COP26 should in fact be postponed because it was unfair to developing countries and the global south, which doesn't have access to vaccines at the same rate. And uh, it's much more difficult for those delegations to get to uh, get to Glasgow and even attend COP26. Um, Jerome, I, I'm going to come to you next. I'd love to hear your response to some of those points that um, Rachel made about uh, the the need for equity and the sort of divisions that we're starting to see uh, between um, developing countries and, and the developed world, which will be, of course, on display next week. Yes. Um, when it comes to what Rachel spoke to and the question overall of what role private sectors play, what we have to think about is the fact that what we need right now is the political fortitude, the financial intelligence, and the, the socio-political awareness of what needs to happen for us to progress to the next level. The problems that define our time right now have been solved with technology and they have already been solved. They've already been thought through and they've already been implemented. But right now what we need is for them to be implemented through government and for them to be followed up by organizations and by companies in collaboration with community organizers that can develop the mechanical systems, the technology, the software and the vehicles of implementation that can advance us to that next era of renewable energy and away from the era of dirty and polluting fossil fuels. With regards to what's happening right now um, with COP26 being postponed and what um, developing nations need in the aspect of equity, what we're seeing right now is a complete lack of equity because we're only talking about what rich nations haven't done and not talking about the fact that richer countries have continued and continue to pollute and destroy communities at the front lines. Whether that's South America, whether that's African continent, or whether that's Southeast Asia. They are reeling from the effects of rich countries that are, that are literally polluting massively in exorbitant numbers that are feeling the least impacts right now. But the people that have polluted the least are being impacted first and worst. Communities right now like Guatemala, like communities like Bangladesh and communities like Uganda are reeling from a crisis that they didn't cause but they're not even being invited to the table to talk about solutions. The communities at the Global South right now have an immense wealth of knowledge about how we must live in, in tandem in with, in with collaboration with nature. But right now our economic systems and our political models live at odds with the natural cycles. So that at its core is, is it completely um, not, not working in tandem with what, what we say we want to do. If we want to we want to transition away from renewable, away from fossil fuels and transition to renewable energy. We have to work with the, the leaders that have been around for thousands of years that have that knowledge and have that experience of working with nature and working alongside nature. What also has to happen is that for companies, they have to continue to know that this isn't just something that you can say, oh, we're, we're going to eventually get there. But what we have to see in companies like Microsoft have been doing this is that they've actually made commitments and actually year over year have to show progress that they've made. That is what the role of, of corporate of corporations have is to not just say, say overall great um, talking points and great rhetoric, 
but actually follow that up with real and tangible action and solutions that impact communities right now. In America, we have millions and millions of people that are looking for good paying and dignified jobs. And right now we need for companies to follow that up with the infrastructure for people to be employed in creating um, solar, solar farms and wind turbines because that's the future of, of, of America and the rest of the world. So you see a, a clear role for the private sector, but uh, it won't really add up to much if some of the fundamental issues of uh, equality and justice can't be addressed uh, first. Absolutely. Um, and Brad, uh, Brad, how do you see this issue? Well, I, I think this is a great conversation because your question is, is the private sector doing enough? And I think the answer you've heard quite rightly is that we're not yet a stage where anyone is doing enough. If we were, if anyone was doing enough, we would probably be making more progress than every scientific report says we are. Um, so if I sort of think about the role of the private sector, the first thing I would say was 2020 was sort of the year of expanding climate pledges by a number of large companies. And yeah, at Microsoft, we sort of kicked off a lot of that because we came out with our carbon negative pledge last January. And I think a pledge is a good place to start. You know, it gets companies to <clears throat> think, to put a stake in the ground, to commit to take action. But I also think Jerome makes a really good point. You know, you're not gonna solve the world by pledging alone. You know, you've gotta turn these pledges into effective action. And I would then say, if this were easy to do, it probably wouldn't be worthy of this conversation. This is hard work. Um, it's hard work because of the measurement issue, because of nascent technology, you know, because of the magnitude of, of just change. And I think it's right to say, as everyone is, because of the magnitude of inequity, not just between the global north and the global south, uh, but even in industrial countries, you take a country like the United States and you see the adverse impact on, on, on say, people of, of color and different socioeconomic groups. Uh, now, I will say, when it comes to the private sector, we need to get at it as we are. We need to hold ourselves accountable. We need to be transparent, as I think more and more companies are striving to do. As we said at Microsoft, we had reduced our emissions by 6% from 2019 to 2020. That was a good first step. It's basically a step we need to sustain every year. But I would then just back up and say, at the end of the day, you know, the General Assembly will always be a place where governments alone get to speak and vote, but we will not solve this problem by governments acting alone or businesses acting alone or civil society acting alone. And so what we increasingly need of the UNGA meetings, the COP meetings and elsewhere is the kind of conversation that brings us all together from around the world and from the different sectors of society that need to find new ways to work together. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are watching this online. Please feel free to join in our discussion, post your questions, and I'll get to as many questions as I can uh, in just a minute. Um, but before I do, uh, I'd like to ask a little bit more about the pandemic and how these two sort of forces, the pandemic and climate change, have, have interacted. Uh, we've obviously seen that there's a logistical challenge. The, the pandemic poses a huge logistical challenge for the organizers of UNGA and the organizers of COP. Um, but beyond that, the pandemic has also kind of opened up uh, these issues and rifts uh, over equality and justice, even, uh, even ex exacerbated some of those um, issues. And Rachel, I'd like to ask you, uh, at the end of the day, do you think COVID-19 has been a good thing or a bad thing for climate action? Oof. Um, you know, the response, well, I think it, it gave us, a, it was like a little tear in the cloth. It, it gave us an insight into the future where we ignore threats in, in, in uh, that are right in front of us um, at our peril, that we can't protect ourselves if we don't protect everybody. And, and these are truths that we need to implement in our response to climate impacts. Uh, at the same time, we fumbled the recovery and that we had an opportunity to be bold, steer it closer towards a greener and more equitable pathway. 
before the pandemic, the IMF was warning us of um, a failure of inclusion as being corrosive to growth and development. And, uh, and we knew we needed to decarbonize and we've kind of flubbed uh, the recovery in the first instance. And now we've got to recover. We now have a world where everybody is warning that we've decoupled the developing world and the developed world. Richer countries may do OK and poorer countries are going to get poorer. So we've got some very profound uh, schisms that we can't just paper over. And the response to COVID is really the same as the response to climate. We need to build uh, inclusion within communities locally, between countries. We need a step change in the kinds of uh, risks we're prepared to take to invest in the green infrastructure and the resilience that countries need. And we've got almost no time to do it. So it was a wake up call and it's up to us whether we listen and we need political leaders, you know, that will, you know, back the kinds of foresight that companies like Microsoft are, you know, are able to demonstrate with the new technologies. And we need to find ways to make those new technologies available to everybody quickly. So um, uh, I don't know whether we're worse or better off from a climate perspective, but we're, um, we've got a, a hole to dig out of and we need political leadership as well as uh, science and uh, partnership to be able to do so. Thank you, Rachel. And Jerome, how do you see this issue? I mean, you were one of the leaders of the, the youth, uh, climate youth movement and protesting. Um, how has the pandemic intersected with, um, with your work uh, and, and, and your advocacy for, for climate issues? The pandemic has changed how the entire world works, especially now looking, looking back at the height of it. It required that we have an evolution of thought and a revolution in how we think about solutions. When we entered into the pandemic, it showed that multiple crises can exist at the same time. We can have a pandemic that's impacting communities, but there can also be a rise in racial justice, and there can also be a rise in the climate crisis as well. That has showed that when we think about solutions and how we think about intersectionality has to change. At the very foundations of how we attack problems has to be intersectional every step of the way and inherent in how we go about framing problems. Because if we think about the climate crisis as only an issue of emissions and only an issue of reducing carbon, then we forget about the fact that climate has reeled and destroyed communities in the past. And we have to reconcile with that past before and, and, and also as we prepare for the future. We have to have a dual mindset. And that shows itself in the pandemic, especially when we think about how adults and older, older people have been at increased risk of the, of the pandemic. And that is the inverse for the, for the climate crisis. Young Americans and, and young people in general are at the forefront and are at the most vulnerable when it comes to the climate crisis. And what that shows is that if young people continue to had to take out of school and had to sacrifice for older generations, now as we see the climate crisis, we need to have that same approach for adults. Because if we sacrifice for you, you have to sacrifice for us as well because we're all in this global community together. And if we're united in crisis, then we must be united in our solution. That is the biggest takeaway from the pandemic. And also when we think about intersectionality, for myself, I'm a threefold person, just as many in my generation are because we have to be. I'm a software engineer, I'm studying to become a software engineer, and I'm also a climate activist. And also I understand this, the socioeconomic aspects of the climate crisis as well. So when we think about these solutions, we can't just think about one aspect of, oh, well, we can slap a solar panel on the climate crisis and call it a day. No, we have to think about how the pandemic has shown that crises can compound upon each other and continue to exacerbate even existing social inequities. Thank you, Jerome. So the pandemic has really kind of illuminated how some of these connections. Um, I'd also like to ask you, I'm gonna come back to you on this uh, in a moment, what, how the pandemic has impacted the youth movement. I mean, two years ago in 2019, I think Greta Thunberg was leading a march of like a million people down the streets of Manhattan. And obviously here we are, it's, it's UNGA, people aren't really there in person and it's really changed this movement that uh, you were very much a part of. So I'm gonna come back to you on that. Um, but Brad, first I'd like to hear from you on this question of how the pandemic has impacted climate change. Has it given us a glimpse of how we can live with lower emissions or, or in fact set us back? Well, the first thing I would do is I think it's, it behooves us to reflect on the most obvious thing that I don't think we ever talk about. COVID and climate are remarkably similar in, in that 
they both involve threats that spread through the air. <laughs> One is a virus, the other are carbon molecules. And frankly, in both instances, we really would be better off without them to the degree that we are today. Uh, and then second, we've experienced the other obvious fact of life. Um, it turns out because the wind blows, the air doesn't even recognize, much less respect borders. You can stop people from traveling and somehow viruses still manage to make their way from place to place. Uh, and yet, because the world is an uneven place in terms of development and equity, you know, the same phenomenon that it affects us all has differential impact. So we're actually you know, struggling with a, a great similarity. Now, if you step back, then I would say, well, you know, is there any silver lining from our COVID experience that we can draw inspiration from? Well, I would also say, yes, there is. It's also equally obvious. It's the power of science. You know, none of us 18 months ago, I think would have dared to predict that humanity would develop not one, but multiple vaccines in less than a year. And I hope that we'll draw inspiration, not only to use science to understand the carbon crisis, but you know, frankly, to think about what would the equivalent of Operation Warp Speed for carbon look like. But then you get to all of the other factors that I think you, you, you've heard touched upon you know, very well. You know, how do you manage this uneven and unequal impact in the short run? Um, the, you know, there are, yeah, and to answer your question, Yes, I think that in the short run, it has shown us that if people travel less, you can you know, reduce emissions and that will play a role. Um, but I, I think fundamentally the future of the planet is not necessarily going to involve disconnecting different parts of the world or even asking people to travel less. We have so many bigger causes of you know, carbon today and we have so many better opportunities to you know, reduce carbon emissions without, in fact, asking people to give up the things that truly help move the planet forward. Thank you so much, Brad. So there's really some similarities between COVID and climate change. And I like your note of optimism that science can help us uh, deal with both of those. Um, to our audience, thank you so much for all your questions. We've got lots of questions coming in and you can keep asking away. I will get through as many of them as I can. Um, and since we've got so many, I'm just going to let each of you take different questions. Um, here is uh, one question um, about UNGA, um, which is, uh, what does this panel recommend to the UN to get selfish national interests to align for humanity's interest. Uh, Rachel, I'll let you take that one. And um, we've got another question about, um, does Microsoft see a possibility to develop a mobile app to give people a rough idea of their carbon footprint? Brad, I'll let you take that one. Um, and a third question, do we not need to reduce consumption to really tackle climate change? And how do we do that in a consumerist culture. Jerome, uh, I'll let you handle that one. Um, so first, just to, just to repeat, um, the first question is to Rachel, what does this panel recommend uh, for the UN to get self selfish national interest to align for humanity's interest? Uh, okay, so an incomplete uh, answer, I think. Uh, first of all, um, the Secretary General has been pretty clear that we have to do the very obvious things that still aren't done. So uh, we have to exit coal. We have to exit coal immediately. Um, there are well documented a few countries that are still uh, investing in coal. They need to be helped to transition quickly. That requires new sources of funding for them to be able to access in order to do so. And that's going to require philanthropy subsidized funding through multilateral development banks and elsewhere and then private investment you're beginning to see the contours of that so we have to do that we have to stop subsidizing the stuff we need less of and the secretary general's called for that so i think there needs to be some more seriousness uh, around that because we still keep seeing that g7 and g20 countries are subsidizing uh, fossil fuels uh, in a way which is detrimental to the planet thirdly the whole premise of the Paris Agreement is that we ratchet up every five years with more ambition. 
we will know next week that we are far, far off track still in terms of uh, the plans that every country has to cut emissions. And so the UN has to call, I think, uh, we have to speed up the clock. So the UN needs to call everybody together probably in a couple of years and we have to ratchet again. If we're, if we're failing, we've got to go faster, we've got to go deeper. And then I think the UN has to start building up a really detailed map of how resilient countries are and what it's going to take to make them more resilient. So I think we need really detailed uh, resilience sort of indices. Private sector can help a lot with, with that. And then we need to uh, be able to apply the funds domestically and internationally to make sure that everybody can meet a, a standard of resilience, given what we know is going to happen with the climate impacts we've already baked into the atmosphere. Thank you, Rachel. And Jerome, the question about consumerism and uh, living in a consumerist culture. Yeah, thinking about how we change consumption and consumerist culture is really a deeper question about how we change our culture. And the way that we change the, the global culture of consumerism is to educate. Um, first, it's for toddlers that are educated today must see the world, to see, must see the future and see solar, solar powered homes and electric cars as normal. And see homes without solar panels and gas powered cars as the same as my generation sees the rotary phone. We have to have an evolution of thought and how we frame what climate is and what the necessary um, action must be taken. In order for us to change our culture and change how we think about how we, we, we live in, a, in this new age, in this new world, we have to make sure that we're teaching young people and teaching everyone in our culture to live in a sustainable way at every aspect of it. And another way in which we talk about consumption is, first off, we have to acknowledge the fact that in order for us to meet the moment and meet the scale, scope, and speed of the climate crisis, we can't continue to fight a system with just individual actions. What the biggest impact will have is for companies and for corporations and for governments to mandate that we now have to meet and actually have the, the political and moral awareness that we have to make sure that even if we aren't making profits on some things, we have to take the moral high ground. If history reminds me correctly, companies and political leaders had more moral clarity and more courage to stand up and say, even though this isn't profitable for us, we're gonna take a risk and stand on the right side of history. When we talk about segregation in America, there were businesses that stood on the right side of history and made sure that Black Americans had access to food and access to, to the same drinking water that other people had. And if it wasn't for Black people that nearly died on Edmunds Pettus Bridge, like Congressman John Lewis, and it wasn't for the business, businesses that took the risk at the time of standing with morality, we wouldn't be here today and Black people would still be hung all across America. That is the same situation we are in right now across the world. If companies and political leaders don't stand up and force the change, cultural change that we need and socioeconomic change that we need, then we'll be in this eternal loop of reliance on fossil fuels forever. We need to have a moment where we change our culture, not just from demanding that people continue to not eat meat, but make sure that companies and elected leaders understand the pressing need for urgent and bold and courageous change all across our supply chains, all the way into whatever products or legislation we make. Thank you, Jerome. And then Brad, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on those two questions. We also had one on whether we can expect a carbon footprint uh, app from, from Microsoft. Yeah, let me try to knit a couple of these things together. First, let me just point to one thing we all experience in day-to-day -day life. We can go to a grocery store, we can pick up any item before we buy it, and we can see how many calories we'll consume if we choose that product versus a competitor. I think our vision and our cause in part you know, should be to uh, go have a future where you can do that for any grocery product, any product in any store, any product you look at online and be able to easily see how much carbon was emitted in the creation of that product. And if we can create that world, then I am very hopeful that you know, what Jerome was talking about will translate into consumer demand for products that emitted less carbon. And then you unleash the power of the market and you connect it with the force of law and regulation. So then you go to this question, can we expect a mobile app in our future? And I would say, yes, but. The but is this, the app is the easy part. The real problem today is we don't have good data. 
Uh, and you know, part of the challenge is if you look at how an organization really has to manage its carbon accounting today, you know, basically it looks at all of its spending records and it looks, for example, at you know, how many miles or kilometers employees may have driven for trips they expensed or how many uh, you know, dollars they spent uh, on airline flights. And then they just have to you know, compare that to an average of how much carbon was emitted for that kind of activity. But of course, what you really want for the future is differentiation. Well, if the car was an electrical powered car instead of by gasoline, you know, that has a different level of carbon emission. If the airline invested in green fuel, then you get the credit for that. But then when you step back and you think about that, you realize how we need to standardize carbon accounting we then need to connect all of the world's systems together. And then we need technology to knit that, not just for large organizations, but ultimately for every individual. So yes, we should have an app for that. We will have an app for that. The much bigger problem is how we create the data systems so that the app is as meaningful as it should be. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Jerome and Rachel. This has been a very thought-provoking discussion. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, uh, but it's gonna be a really fascinating couple of days ahead at the UN G uh, General Assembly as issues of climate action are out there, out at the forefront uh, in those meetings. Um, I'm going to hand over next to my colleague, Peter Spiegel, the FT's managing editor, and he's going to discuss uh, ending the pandemic for good. Uh, thank you all of you for being here and thanks to our audience for some very thought provoking questions. And Peter, over to you.